I think one of the uh, the best halls actually in the city, and uh, Will Palin, our speaker, is, uh, is is very lucky really to have been working on two of our grandest rooms really in the whole of the capital, uh, at Greenwich, the painted hall, uh, uh, which is now well, wonderfully restored and uh, a, a, a great draw for people too, but a, a great space to experience, and now uh, Bart's Hall. Very different sort of decoration, but uh, a, amazing connection into the, the history of the city and, of course, the Hogarth Staircase, which we're going to hear about now. Uh, so, uh, without more ado... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Will. Thank you very much, Peter. I've never emerged from behind a curtain. <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a great delight to be here. I've been here twice now in two weeks, bizarrely. It's like London buses when, you know, suddenly I, I, you know, I'd heard about this wonderful um, uh, sort of hidden place, um, but I'd never been here. And then I came last week for a, for a dinner and now I'm here again. So wonderful to be back. Um, two things really uh, by way of apology to start with. The first is that um, we're not, I'm not going to be talking about the completed restoration project at Bart's because we've just started. So I'll have to come back in two years and give you an update then. Um, the second apology, and I'm only saying this because I had a slightly bizarre experience a couple of weeks ago when I gave a talk at a livery hall, um, when I, I came up to the lectern and I was about to start and everyone looked rather disappointed and I think, what's that? And I, I realised they thought that Michael Palin was. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, and no. I have to say, Michael Payne is my father, and I wouldn't normally say that, but it has relevance in this story, um, uh, uh, which was that um, he had his heart repaired at St. Bartholomew Hospital um, about five years ago, just before I started with the Heritage Trust. Um, and more recently, he came and officiated at the 900th celebrations there. I managed to persuade him to come in, which was great. Um, and... Uh, uh, you know, I got the usual comments you now, are you his brother? Are you his chauffeur? <laughs> um, so I was getting a bit sort of fed up with all this. And then there was a wonderful moment just as we were leaving when the security guard at the hospital uh, approached my father. And he looked at him and he said, I know who you are. <laughs> he said, Melvin Bragg. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, no, no, I'm not Melvin Bragg. And... You're related to Melvin Brown. <laughs> so that was a, that was a moment. Anyway, more, more of him later. But back to, um, back to Bart. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about a project involving uh, one of the most important grade one listed buildings in any institutional site in the UK, um, the North Wing at the hospital. I'm also going to be talking to you a little bit about um, our plans and how they um, were conceived and developed to bring this hall back to life. Um, but first, I wanted to give you a little bit of a potted history of the hospital itself. Um, as I mentioned, we celebrated our 900th anniversary last year, um, founded in 1123 by an enigmatic figure, an English priest called Rahir, or Rahir, I never know quite how to pronounce his name. Um, he was a significant figure in the court of Henry I, had some kind of uh, responsibility within court to entertain in some way. There has been some suggestion he was a court jester, but I think that's now been um, uh, um, discredited as an idea. Uh, but we do know that at some stage he decided that he hadn't been living a very virtuous life and he needed to go off on a pilgrimage to Rome and do penance. So Ray here went to Rome and um, whilst he was in Rome, he became very sick, uh, probably with malaria, we're not entirely sure. And he was cared for by the monks of St. Bartholomew's Church um, on um, an island in the River Tiber. And he, when he, was on his, when he was on his sickbed, he vowed, were he to recover, that he would found a hospital um, back in London. Um, he did recover. And then before he set off back home, um, he had a terrifying vision, a dream 
where he was picked up by the winged beast of the apocalypse, taken to a high place and made to look into the seething pit of hell. And things obviously weren't looking too good for Ray here at this point. Then suddenly Saint Bartholomew himself appears by his side and he says, Ray here, don't worry, everything will be fine if you also found a priory back in London at a place called Smoothfield, which we now know as Smithfield. And um, uh, Rahir agreed in his vision, and when he was back in London, true to his word, he obtained land from uh, the king, uh, wasteland to the north of the city of London, what we now know as Smithfield, and he founded two institutions, the hospital and the priory. Um, so that is the story of Rahir, and you can see his tomb in the church, the wonderful church of St. Bartholomew the Great, the former priory church, um, and uh, here at his tomb, and uh, sitting at the, e at the end of, by his feet are two little winged figures, and they are holding um, little inscribed um, scrolls, and they are um, <coughs> referencing the, the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, and they talk about, um, uh, they say, uh, I'm just giving you an extract. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. And he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. So this idea of spiritual and physical regeneration happening in this area um, uh, north of the city, which traditionally was used for executions, sort of um, other sporting um, activities, um, and was by all accounts sort of muddy and foul and not a particularly pleasant area. Um, I'm just putting uh, this slide on the right because one of those funny things you get in, in uh, doing the job that I do, I get sent things from all over the place. Of course, Bart's is well known all around the world. And I was sent um, a graphic novel by an Italian artist um, featuring Ray here, <laughs> having his vision. Here he is sweating in bed and uh, the, the beast of the apocalypse picking him up. And so, you know, it just shows that um, the, the, the St. Bartholomew's Hospital and its story and its history um, are, um, are embraced and known around the globe. Um, uh, just a, a, a note um, on the, the site of St. Bartholomew's, you can see this is a sort of plan of Clerkenwell with the city um, at the bottom of the slide, and you have St. Bartholomew's Priory here, and of course the other monastic institutions that grew up and flourished in Clerkenwell from the 12th century onwards. So the next was St John's Priory, um, 1144, um, then St Mary's Nunnery, and finally the Charterhouse <coughs> in the 15th century. And it's these institutions and the the, the sort of echoes of them in the street plan which give Clerkenwell it's very special character, and there's a whole other talk uh, we could, I could give about Clerkenwell and its history. And for those of you interested, um, some of you will know, uh, this is the site of the Clark's Well. Um, of course, this area grew up on the banks of the River Fleet, and that was important and very important in the history of Clerkenwell. Everything from its institutions and, and, and monastic complexes right through to brewing um, and other related trades relied on a plentiful supply of water. And here is a plan of the hospital as it, uh, this is sort of late 17th century. And by this point, the hospital had grown up and would have resembled something like an Oxford or Cambridge college, lots of little courtyards, buildings relating to its function, which of course was to look after the poor and the sick and the needy, um, very much on those monastic um, um, grounds and principles, but also there was a whole lot of other property within the hospital site. So there were tenements, and there was um, uh, uh, there were there was a whole community living in the hospital itself. There was sort of like a gated, a gated community, um, and this made it um, you know interesting, but obviously quite messy and complicated. And when medical advances began to happen in the um, late 17th and early 18th century, the hospital governors um, felt that the hospital needed to be modernised and um, made more suitable for um, its purpose, which was increasingly to treat sick 
patients rather than just to look after and feed the poor and the needy, which was the origins of the hospital in the medieval period. Um, the hospital and the priory were both dissolved by Henry VIII. It's important, that's an important thing to, to grasp. Um, the <coughs> priory, however, was sold off, um, whilst the hospital site sort of languished for a couple of years until the um, City of London successfully petitioned the king to retain the hospital pro buildings and to give them to the City of London to run as a hospital. And I think the king finally signed his royal charter granting, um, the, the, um, granting the land to the City of London, but also um, re um, reconnecting um, the hospital with its estates around the country, which was very important because that was a source of its revenue. And I think um, Henry VIII signed this just a few days before his death, so it was really close to the wire. But the hospital was saved. And um, Henry VIII figures prominently in the iconography of St. Bartholomew's Hospital. Um, this is a uh, the stained glass window, which is now in the Great Hall. The window um, was originally in an earlier hall on the hospital site, and it features the king surrounded by the alderman of the City of London and um, by the first um, superintendent of the hospital. And he, the king is handing him the Royal Charter. This was a very important moment. <coughs> And there are some details. The uh, window, which is in very poor condition, um, is being um, uh, conserved as part of our project. And we've had um, specific funding from the League of Nurses from the hospital for this project. One of those lovely things that happens when you're in this um, sort of uh, community of people who, who love and um, want to help um, the hospital where they've been or worked. So moving on to the 18th century, um, here is the hospital um, in a, a view dated probably about 1700, 1701, the very beginning of the 18th century, and it shows the first classical interloper on the site, the gateway, and this sort of heralded the uh, the classic the the the, 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 the modernisation and the um, rebuilding of the hospital in a classical style, and this gate uh, was by um, someone called Edward Strong Jr. who worked with Christopher Wren at St Paul's Cathedral and um, it was a statement and here it is um, it's been beautifully cleaned and conserved not by us um, I have to be honest about this but by the hospital itself which is remarkable um, this happened because a bit fell off it <laughs> and the hospital panicked completely put a scaffolding up around it and then we persuaded them gently to do a little bit more a little bit more conservation work. And this is great because we now have the lease to this building. It means we, we don't have to do quite as much as we would have done um, had this not happened. So the, the gateway features, of course, Henry VIII above the gateway. Um, I'm told the only public effigy of Henry VIII in London, is that right? I've, I've yet to be contradicted. So, um, And then this wonderful sort of pediment, this split pediment, and... Uh, which um, is um, which features two uh, recumbent figures of lameness and disease. Very important. This leaves you into no doubt of what this institution is all about. There by Francis Bird, um, a sculptor who worked with Wren and, and other um, important uh, architects of this period. Um, he also did, I think, the relief at the bottom of the monument one of those key kind of craftsman sculptures of the period. And um, this idea was based on um, another institution that had been built in the late 17th century, and that was Bedlam or Bethlehem Hospital in Moorfields in Finsbury. And that was by Robert Hooke. And it featured a gateway with the recumbent figures of melancholy and raving madness. Um, and they were by a sculptor called um, Caius Sibber. Um, Sibber um, was the father of the playwright, Colly Sibber, interestingly, but he was a significant um, sculptor in his own right and an architect of, of some sorts. He actually built and designed a, a, a church now demolished in Stepney in a place called Wellclose Square, um, which is another, another story. And here is um, one of eight roundels in the 
foundling hospital, another of those great institutions of the 18th century. Um, these are beautiful things, and they show other hospitals and charitable institutions around London. And here's Bedlam with the, <coughs> you see the gate pierce here with the figures of melancholy and raving madness. Um, the, these figures survive, and they're in the Bedlam Museum of the Mind in, um, in Beckenham. And they really are worth a visit. They're powerful things, and they're rather beautiful. And they, um, uh, they famously inspired William Hogarth, who we'll come to again later, um, to portray the figure of Tom Rakewell, the rake in the last scene of the rake's progress. Tom, for you, if you don't know, the story is that he inherits a fortune from his miserly father. He decides to sort of become a gentleman, ape the aristocracy, and um, fritter all his money away, and eventually he ends up in uh, a lunatic asylum. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, as I said, the, the figure, the, the portrayal of Tom Rakewell is based on Sibus figure of melancholy Magnus. Um, and here is a, a view of the founding hospital just to remind you of um, uh, another important charitable <coughs> institution and architecturally significant uh, just north of uh, here obviously in Hoburn, demolished in the 1930s, but these little sort of, um, gate buildings survive. Um, and uh, the collection is housed in a new, in a 1930s building um, to the north of the site, um, which um, features the panelling from the original boardroom, various other works of art. So, um, 17, 17, about 1720, the hospital governess decided that they really, the hospital needed to be modernised and redeveloped and they recruited an architect called James Gibbs onto the Board of Governors. Now Gibbs, um, it's very important to remember that Gibbs at this point was at the <coughs> beginning of his <coughs> career that was a star career. I mean, he was, um, right up to the 19th century, he was regarded on, on, the same, on the same level as Christopher Wren in terms of his importance in British architecture. He had built, um, St. Mary Le Strand Church, um, which, had called, which was a sensation. Um, now, Gibbs had studied um, under Carlo Fontana in Rome, and uh, Fontana was regarded to be the fountainhead of the Italian Baroque. So Gibbs had had first-hand experience, and this brought him a lot of kudos and a lot of status. So when he came to London, despite being a Catholic, despite having some issues um, with, his, with, with patronage, he became established and he went on to design dozens and dozens of, um, of buildings, both private houses and institutional buildings, including, of course, um, St. Martin um, in the Fields Church, um, Senate House and the Gibbs Building at King's College, Cambridge, and the Radcliffe Camera. Um, and uh, which features, I think, in Saltburn, doesn't it? Not that I've seen the film, but apparently it's very, very prominent. Um, so Gibbs agrees, and he agrees to design and redesign the hospital for free. And um, this seemed like a very generous act, which I suppose it was, but also Gibbs saw this as an opportunity. Whatever he did at Barts would be um, very important for his reputation, and um, it was a building that was that people knew, and it was a project which was um, uh, well known. And he had an opportunity here to do something significant. So um, he began to think about what form the modernised hospital should take. And he came up with the idea of creating a square, which wasn't a new idea in itself. But what was new about it was the square would consist of four independent classical blocks. And um, the, the, um, uh, you know, there, there were lots of other buildings of that time that were utilising the, the uh, sort of, um, I suppose, more Palladian than Baroque detailing, this sort of restrained use of classical, the classical orders with the, with the uh, rusticated ground floor, the alternate segmental and triangular pediments, the palace front, this idea that you unified, in this case, 
um, King Square in Bath by um, John Wood the Elder, um, you unified lots of separate buildings under one cloak of um, uh, imitating a grand um, classical palace. And of course, Christchurch um, in Oxford, the Petwater quad Quadrangle designed by Henry Ald Aldrich, uh, Dean Aldrich, who was an amateur architect. Um, but um, again, you have essentially a series of lots of little apartments and rooms for the students, but unified with this classical language. And this was important and significant um, in terms of um, Gibbs's plans for Bath. So Gibbs designed his um, new hospital with four blocks. Um, and um, he knew that the, by building them independently, um, it meant that he could build the project over time because it would take money to raise, it would take time to raise the money mm -hmm. for the hospital project. And he also knew that um, by separating the buildings, it would um, prevent the risk of fire spreading throughout the institution. And of course, um, there was a suggestion that um, by separating the wards, you would prevent the risk of the spread of infection. So this was quite an interesting uh, revolutionary idea for a, for a hospital um, site. Um, so Gibbs and the governors um, got to work on the first block um, in about uh, 1724, 1725, and that's the north wing of St. Bartholomew's Hospital, built as the administration block. And um, this was never intended to have any clinical use. It might seem odd. The first building you're building is not going to house any patients at all. But it was there to make a statement. It was there to be a sort of showcase for the rest of the hospital project, the fundraising centre of the new St. Bartholomew's Hospital. The same thing happened at Greenwich with the Painted Hall. That was the first of the Wren sort of blocks to be completed. <coughs> and it acted as a as a sort of magnet to attract more patronage and support and was intended to be splendid, splendid beyond imagination, this idea that it would inspire and persuade people to become involved in this great project and to leave money for the hospital and its ongoing work. Um, so um, work begins on the North Wing and um, just before that, the hospital governors had taken decision to use Bath Stone for the hospital blocks. This was because Ralph Allen or Rafe Allen, the entrepreneur and um, quarry owner from Bath, whose stone built much of what we now know as, as Georgian Bath, um, he'd been looking for a while for a project in London to, to, to which he could sell his stone. And he tried at Greenwich, but Hawksmoor, Nicholas Hawksmoor was not convinced. Um, so, being a real salesman, Ralph Allen did this incredible thing. He, he held a public demonstration, I think at Greenwich, where he took a block of Portland stone, a block of Bath stone, and he theatrically subjected these two stones to various cruel treatments to simulate the London climate. So they were sort of hit with chains, hot coals were put on them, they were doused in water. And at the end of this demonstration, the Bath stone block was pristine and the Portland stone block had completely crumbled away to nothing. <laughs> Cheat. And the hospital, the hospital governors were completely conned by this and they agreed to use um, um, Bath stone. Now Gibbs wasn't, was worried about this, so he persuaded them to take out an insurance policy. And here it is, it's an indenture or bond um, with Ralph Allen, which said that um, uh, which lasted until 1760. If there had been any defects before that time, then he would take personal responsibility for replacing the stone. Um, Gibbs died in the 1750s before the, the hospital project was completed. The project was completed in about 1760, and the first defects appeared the following year, just a year <laughs> after the indenture ran out. So it's a familiar story. Um, and what happened after that was in the 19th century, the Hardwick family of architects, three generations who were surveyors at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, ended up replacing all the Bath stone with Portland stone. Yeah. Completely refaced. There's only a little bit of the Bath stone left, and that's in the archway under the North Wing. It's worth having a look at if you ever visit the hospital. That's a little archway through the North Wing. So that's the North Wing facing the courtyard um, with its Portland stone. 
Um, and uh, you can see here, of course, again, this sort of restrained use of the classical orders. Um, there's a bit of rustication on the ground floor, but gen just generally in the archway here, you have these blocked window surrounds, the famous Gibbs surround, um, which Gibbs um, sort of digested and, and redeployed from classical sources. Um, and just, you know, but the, the, the window openings are treated quite plainly. And then the balustrade on the, uh, which originally would have been topped by urns. So there is the north wing. And the two projecting ends, which distinguish it from the other blocks at Bath, were to house at one end the hospital clerk or steward, the man who sort of effectively ran the hospital, and on the other end, the counting house, where all the hospital monies and the, 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 the rents and revenues would be totted up. And, um, and there was also a room where patients would be assessed for to be admitted to the hospital. You, if you wanted to come to the hospital, you needed to come with a recommendation, a letter of recommendation, and you were assessed by a committee before you were admitted. Now, what Gibbs did rather brilliantly is he, he put his courtyard on access with, on axis with the new gatehouse. So he created a series of great architectural episodes. You would come under the Henry VIII gatehouse from the very busy, dirty, smelly West Smithfield. You know, the meat market was still operational until the 19th century. And it would have been fairly intense outside the hospital walls, which was a reason why Gibbs built the square um, some distance from West Smithfield. And he was criticized for this when the hospital was finished and I think it didn't really understand there was a reason why the hospital wasn't announcing itself publicly on, on West Smithfield. That's because it wasn't a place you wanted to have a hospital um, um, uh, really given the, um, what, what went on in, uh, in, in the, the live meat market. So everything was pushed back. And you then passed, as you come under the arch where you passed the hospital chapel, the church of St. Bartholomew the Less, and then you go underneath the north wing itself through this archway. It's a very dramatic, interesting experience. And you go into the square itself. And that's another wonderful moment. Um, a grand sort of civic square within the hospital. And then you turn and you enter the Hogarth staircase where the fireworks really start. And um, uh, here are two photographs of the staircase um, as it is today, except it's not as it is today because it's now full of scaffolding for our project. And this rather wonderful posed photograph from the 1960s where the nurses have been arranged on the staircase to look at the, look at the paintings. And these rather kind of fantastic um, uh, cast iron lamps, which I'm hoping to replace because they were taken out. And I think I've found someone that's got one of them somewhere. So more on that later. Um, so up the Hogarth staircase. And um, the story of the staircase is fairly well known. What happened was the governors were intending to decorate the staircase. Um, and they lined up an Italian called Giacomo Amagoni, or Amagoni, who was um, a established um, figure um, in England at the time. He was a Venetian painter. He'd undertaken similar large-scale commissions. He was, a, he was a safe pair of hands. However, William Hogarth, who was born just a stone's throw from the hospital in Bartholomew Close, he heard that the, this commission was going to go to an Italian, and he didn't like this. He <laughs> felt very strongly that this was an opportunity for an English artist to demonstrate that English can do it as well as the as the uh, artists of France and Italy. So he came in and he persuaded the governess to allow him to take on this commission. Um, and I think quite a, a major part of the um, success of his uh, um, negotiations was that he agreed to do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> a bit like Gibbs. Um, and again, with similar, similar intentions, Hogarth was a clever man. He realised that the great and the good of the capital and elsewhere, becoming up this staircase, they would hopefully admire his great works and he, they would commission him to undertake work and, and other projects for them. So Hogarth got to work on these two huge paintings, both on canvas, not, on, not painted directly onto the wall, 
Um, the first painted in Covent Garden, the studio brought in in sections and installed. And the second painting, the Good Samaritan, which was painted in situ by Hogarth. And he had never attempted anything of this scale before. You know, he, was, he, he did his little oil paintings. He did his popular modern moral progresses that made him rich. Of course, it was the engravings made from those paintings that made him famous. Um, but he, he was... Um, he was sort of driven by an ambition to, to elevate English art to a scale of heroic painting. And his father-in-law was Sir James Thornhill, who painted, of course, the Painted Hall at Greenwich, considered to be the greatest achievement of any English de um, um, decorative artist um, uh, 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 before or since. And um, he, he wanted, Hogarth wanted to, to use the the opportunity here to show that England could stand on its own two feet when it came to this kind of work. And that's relevant in the subject matter of this too. So he chose two scripture stories, as he called them, um, stories from the New Testament. The first, of course, is Christ at the Pool of Bethesda. And it features Christ in the centre, um, uh, outside the healing pool, outside Jerusalem, where, if you arrived after the angel had come down and rippled the water and you got into the, the pool quickly, you'd be cured of whatever illness you had. And Christ, of course, encounters a paralyzed man, a lame man. He says to him, you know, what, will thou not be made whole? And the man said, I can't get to the pool. I, I, I've got no man to carry me there. And Christ says to him, pick up thy bed and walk, and he is cured. And I sometimes think that's a bit Hogarth. Like, Come on, you can do it. Stand on your own two feet, you know. There's a bit of sort of, dare I say, Brexit going on in this, this thing. Um, and then, um, but Hogarth adds a whole lot more to this. You know, Hogarth is a great storyteller. And a great, um, he had a sort of idea of what sort of um, excited the public imagination. So he creates this crowd of the innocent afflicted. These are essentially the patients of the hospital. This, sort of this procession behind Christ, they're coming to be cured. And they all have various illnesses that have been very carefully depicted by Hogarth, who had a friend in the hospital, um, a surgeon called John Frake, who was an eye surgeon. And it may account for the blind man here with the stick being included in this group of figures. And we have a man with a gouty arm, a woman with inflamed breast, a, 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 a woman with some kind of wasting disease, a boy with some congenital illness here, curvature of the spine, he's at the front um, with his back to us. Um, and Hogarth, um, all these are, I say, based on real, uh, real understanding or um, observation of, of hospital patients at the time, and our consultants still to this day can argue over exactly what's wrong with all these people. It's quite a good sort of um, t uh, training tool. Um, so there they are, queuing up behind Christ to get to the, get to the pool. And then Hogarth being Hogarth introduces the villain of the piece, the wealthy woman who's arriving and attempting to jump the queue. So here she with her entourage and her servant is, is, is asking the guard to prevent the woman with the baby from entering the enclosure so her mistress can come in first. I think it's actually it's a, it's a sympathetic portrayal of the woman herself. And the, 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 the intimation here is that whatever illness she's got, she's brought upon herself um, through her work activities, whatever that may be. And in the engravings you have, um, you clearly see lesions and signs of, um, of venereal disease on her skin. So that's happening here. Then finally, on the far right, you have this ghostly, ghastly figure representing death. And he's looking down into a hole in the ground. And I think this figure was placed here very purposefully by Hogarth because um, it's on the first landing, so when the hospital governors had finished their, their, their banquets and their fundraising dinners, they would come down the staircase and be confronted by this reminder. We share a common end, and uh, we better get to work in this life to, to um, help the, the, the poor and the needy. And uh, the other painting, which I won't talk about at length, is The Good Samaritan. And here we have, of course, the Israelite traveller who's attacked by robbers, um, uh, left, is stripped, uh, left for dead by the side of the road. And the only person that comes to his aid is the reviled Samaritan. They hate each other. The, the Samaritans are a sort of ostracised tribe. 
and he is coming and he is um, pouring vinegar onto the, the injured man's wound in this very kind of visceral moment. You can see his right fist is clenched. Hogarth adds wonderful humanity and empathy to these um, paintings. I mean, they can be criticised in terms of their grouping and their classical structure, but um, he, he gives them something that certainly no um, trained continental artist would have done. So he's about to be taken off to safety, and of course the, the priest and the religious teacher walk by on the other side of the road without helping. So um, Paul of Bethesda is the sort of reminder of the, the Christian charitable um, foundation of the hospital, and the Good Samaritan, perhaps this is the working hospital, this is man healing man doing, doing its thing. And then there's rather lovely little cartouches by Hogarth's assistant Richards underneath, which are episodes from the life of Ray here. So everything's packed into this staircase. You, you, by the time you've got to the top, you've learned everything about the hospital, everything you need to know. And then, bam, <laughs> the final kind of the crescendo is the Great Hall itself. A spectacular space. Um, it's, uh, it's almost a perfect triple cube for those of you interested in your architectural proportions. Um, it's 30 foot um, uh, high and 30 foot wide, about 90, just over 90 foot long. And um, uh, it features this incredible ceiling by a plasterer called jo John Baptiste Sam Michaeli, who we don't know that much about, but he worked with Gibbs on other projects. And the other feature, of course, these, these donor boards, there are the names of 3,000 benefactors on the walls of the Great Hall. Um, philanthropy writ large. This is a, a temple to philanthropy and a reminder of how important this was at the time. And um, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an inscription in a stone tablet outside the, the north wing as you approach from the gatehouse. And there, there, are, two, there are two inscriptions, from the, an extract from the same psalm, Psalm 41. And one of them, one of them say, says, Blessed is he that considereth the poor and needy. The Lord shall deliver him in his time of trouble. So this is a sort of insurance policy, I think, for all these people to make sure that if they do good, they'll be looked after and they will have a safe passage through in the, in, in, in the afterlife, whatever may happen later. And there's lots of iconography. There's the charter window I've mentioned. There's Edward VII, there's St. Bartholomew, there's another portrait of Henry VIII, so everything is there's all the meaning in this space. Um, and uh, one thing that we've done, which is quite fun, is, uh, is that the, 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 the list of names stopped in 1905, and we have just restarted them for our project. So rather than, rather than being £50, as it was then, to, to get on this side of the wall, and that, that qualified you to be hospital governor, and being a hospital governor was important because you brought with it some kudos and some, some status, but also it meant you could recommend, a, recommend people to be looked after in the hospital. So um, a lot of these people would have been using that, to, using their, their position to help, um, you know, friends and, and, uh, and perhaps domestic servants who couldn't afford to get here ordinarily to get into the hospital itself. And we have, um, we've restarted this list it's no longer £50, it's £50,000. <laughs> We're doing very well. We've got over 20 names. <laughs> it's fun. The, the hall was used, as I said, as a ceremonial centre of the hospital banquets. This is one of the, the bills of fare for one of the great fundraising banquets from the 18th century. We did, um, we did try to recreate this for a, a, a gala dinner we did last year um, with limited success. Some of the dishes weren't, didn't translate particularly well. But, you know, it just shows how much stuff, you know. We've got gammon chickens, dishes of fish, or it goes on and on. There's all sorts of stuff. Um, lots and lots and lots of alcohol <laughs> consumed. So... Um, that brings us up to the 18th century. The hospital of Lee has continued to flourish as an institution. It survived the Great Fire, the plague, Virginia Bottomley, who tried to close the hospital, some of you remember, in the 1990s. And each time it's emerged st stronger as an institution. Um, uh, and the hospital has flourished. The, if you go to the South Wing, which is the only one of the, the James Gibbs buildings that has been rebuilt, three of his wings survive. If you go in there, you'll find a huge modern atrium. 
It is the busiest cardiac hospital in the world, St. Bartholomew's Hospital, um, a centre of excellence for cardiology and oncology. It's thriving and busy and still has a reputation for excellence. Um, the north wing of the hospital, our building, has not fared well because there was no clinical use. So the NHS didn't invest any money in it and it fell into disrepair. And there was a great hoo-ha, um, great controversy about 20 years ago. Eventually that led to the founding of a new preservation trust. The idea was this trust would take on the buildings eventually, take um, a brilliant, um, uh, bring, bring in charitable funding to restore the buildings without drawing on NHS resources. And that charity was called Bart's Heritage, and I arrived about four and a half years ago in the midst of, co just before COVID actually, to raise supposedly 20 million to, <laughs> to restore the buildings. Um, and I'm pleased to say that we have now raised enough money to start the first phase, so that's just over 10 million. We will, we, and work has started on the buildings. I'll, I'll show you a few slides in a moment. And we will complete in 2025. Um, probably around September. And our work will address the envelope of the building, the roof, which is in terrible condition, the stonework, the windows, the ironwork, all those details. And we'll do a beautiful and loving conservation and repair job in the Great Hall and the Hogarth Stair. And the idea is the hall will be, um, will continue to ger generate revenue, but will be open to the public for the first time ever. And we've also got a really, really interesting um, program of um, heritage and health related events, which is part of our, was part, a core part of our lottery bid. And the lottery, the Heritage Fund, have supplied um, over half the money for this project. So we're very, very grateful to them. Here's just some idea of some of the problems, water ingress, um, damage in various areas of the um, Great Hall itself. The Hogarth painting's in reasonable condition. The structure of that staircase is very poor. Um, a lot of money needs to be spent to get the, that, that space back into um, a, a state where it's going to be sustainable. New conservation, heating, new lighting. The presentation of those paintings is going to be crude because they're, they're very poorly presented at the moment. So lots of, lots of quite technical work to be done. And here is some of the early investigation. I was saying to someone that, the, that I, although I'm not a doctor, the building is a bit like my patient. You know, you have to investigate it, find out what's wrong with it, x-ray it. Um, and then once you think you know what's wrong with it, you've got to develop some kind of sort of methodology, some kind of treatment to bring it back to life. Fortunately, there's lots of brilliant people, some of whom I've brought from the Painted Hall project. So um, our painting conservators... Stephen Payne and Sophie Stewart, both Courtauld um, alumni, alumni, are um, leading on the conservation side. And uh, we're working with a brilliant um, uh, specialist in environmental monitoring, some of you may know, called Toby Curtis. It's extraordinary. He's one of the first people to really begin to fully understand how the environment of a building affects its historic contents and interior. So the building is, is full of little monitoring equipment little monitoring boxes which send data to Cambridge where it's analysed and you can begin to build a picture of the building, how it's working thermally um, and in terms of its, the, 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 the um, humidity. The rest of the problems are pretty obvious to see. This is the roof which is pretty horrific. Uh, it's re-roofed after the war in copper very well but copper has a limited lifespan, about 40 or 50 years. The copper has degraded and um, water has been getting in. So we'll be replacing all the copper with lead and we'll be re-slating the building using, um, we think, most of the original slates. So um, you know, that, that's going to be a major part of the project. Here are more images. And then we're up to the sort of, we're onto the more enjoyable bits, like what colour do we paint the Great Hall? <laughs> so we've been having fun. We know there was an olive colour to the wall originally. This is Patrick Beatty, our painting um, expert, who's there up a ladder, painting a bit of the olive paint. It, it, it's very striking, but I think it might be a bit overwhelming. We'll probably go for something, a sort of a stony colour, a bit less yellow than it is at the moment. Um, interestingly, when the donor boards were originally painted, they were porphyry. So it would have been quite a kind of wah, interior in the 18th century. I don't think quite, I think it would be, be fun, but probably a bit risky to go down that line. 
And the exciting thing about this project is like it we did at Greenwich, we're opening up the scaffolding for the public during the work. So in June, you'll be able to buy a ticket and go on a conservation tour where you'll be learn about what's going on. You'll be able to observe and talk to the conservation team um, and, and learn about the process. And people are interested. I, mean, I don't have to tell you because you all are, but I, at Greenwich, I was amazed by how deeply interested the public were in the process itself. I thought they'd be interested in the history and the, the paintings, but they wanted to know the science behind what we were doing. And that was great. So we're going to be doing a lot more of that um, at Bar. So here's one of those scaffold tools we did at Greenwich, where we, you got up on a, right on a deck underneath the ceiling, and it was very bizarre and sort of weird, those great bits of Baroque painting above your head. And we had 90,000 visitors at Greenwich during the project. And the, brought in a bit of extra money. Health and well-being I've mentioned, I started just before COVID. When COVID struck, we opened the building for the hospital staff as a bit of a refuge, a place where they could come and escape the sterile and high-pressured environment of the hospital wards. And it was tremendously successful. We had such positive feedback, we de developed this idea and we began to think about ways in which we could embed this into the future of the building itself, not just for the staff, but for the public itself, and indeed for the patients of the hospital and the visitors, the families of people visiting the hospital. Um, and this is just from, I think, 2021, when we opened the building for Open House Weekend, and we had nearly 3,000 visitors in one day. And it just shows that how, this is a hidden treasure, people don't, you know, they, no, not many people know about the Hogarth paintings, not many people know about the Great Hall. So when it is open to the public, it's a great draw. And this gives us a lot of confidence that when we finish the project, it will be an asset, a great cultural um, addition to um, the Culture Mile in London, in the City of London. Of course, the Museum of London is going to be opening in 2026 in the um, General Market site in Smithfield Market. And here we're working with an anaesthetist and some of his trainees looking at some items from the archive. Gianpaolo brings his trainees to look at the Hogarth to teach him about, teach his trainees about empathy, reconnecting with the human being. Very interesting idea. And here we are doing some slow looking and some um, other activities with um, the public as part of our pilot program of activities. And, it, you know, um, it's, it's, um, we had lots of wonderful feedback. But I, this last one, I think, was so moving from somebody who took part in one of our pilot activities. She said, my mum is in the cancer unit, so I visit every day. This has momentarily taken my mind off things. Normally, every minute of my day is suffused with negative thoughts. It's been really lovely to think about something different and feel like I've achieved something. It's given me a goal that I want to continue with art making now. It's amazing. I'm so glad I saw that poster. It's been good for me. So we have this opportunity with Barts and with these wonderful interiors to, to hopefully make a difference to um, the way people um, are feeling and to make a positive contribution to, um, to their lives. And um, we're, we're going to be, we're, we're running this program obviously through our lottery funded project, but also in conjunction with Historic England, who are very interested in measuring the, the benefits of heritage and art. Um, uh, the, the, the health and well-being benefits of those things. And we had, did have an exhibition from the, the Welcome Institute, uh, Welcome um, uh, um, Gallery in 2021. These were two large-scale um, photographs of rainforests and we, um, we suffused the room with, with sound and smell so you could sort of immerse yourself in this this area, and it's partly kind of um, inspired by this, uh, the effects of COVID, particularly in sort of dulling the senses and this idea that we would try and sort of get things going again. And it was great fun. There's, a, there's, there's an existing great cultural programme in the hall. This will continue. We have a partnership with the City Music Foundation. And here, there's a gratuitous slide of me with the, uh, <laughs> the yeah, then Prince of Wales, who's our patron. Um, he helped with the fundraising, I have to say. And here he is as King cutting our cake um, in the end of 2022 when we reached our fundraising target. I know for architects, um, the King is always the most popular figure, but um, <laughs> I, use, I use him to wind up my cousin, Catherine. Who's not um, and there he is going out into the square to meet the, the, the staff. It was, it was actually quite a joyful visit. 
Um, we got our grant from the lottery um, in 2022, which enabled us to get to work. And here is that, um, it, uh, we're adding our, the first new names to the wall in 120 years. Um, and there's our wonderful letterer, um, Phil Siri, um, brilliant um, craftsman. Um, but a Republican. So when it came to <laughs> introducing him to the king, I was a bit nervous and he was, he was a bit grumpy. But then he got chatting and it was all all right. So, um, and here are some of our, some of our names. So it's, it's really fun to be able to continue this tradition. It's been crucial in us reaching our, our fundraising target mm. and we'll be carrying that on in the hall itself. Um, and just a few other things we did for the 900th. Um, so many of you will know this gentleman Adam Dant. He's a topographical artist based in Spitalfields, and we commissioned him to do a celebratory work of art for the 900th anniversary of the hospital. And he, I met him in Beppe's cafe down the road, and I, I, I knew what Adam did, I knew him quite well, and I said, oh, could you do something for us? And um, he then went off and, and decided to do it at this enormous scale, which was fine, but it did take him a lot longer than we thought, <laughs> and it became much, much more expensive than I, than I planned. Um, but um, he, he produced this, uh, I don't know whether the, um, I did have a sort of film footage of it. It might, um, it might may or may not work, um, probably not. But it's, um, you have the hospital itself um, overlaid with 900 stories from its history. And there's a whole sort of scroll that goes with the painting so you can identify all the figures in it. And we had this copy, we had a copy, full size copy made and it hangs in the hospital foyer. So when you go to the hospital, you see all, these, all the patients and visitors are looking at it and really enjoying it. And I think it's lovely because there's so many, there's so much hospital art that's sort of slightly kind of, you know, um, not, not really always relevant to the experience of the, the people there. And, and this, I think, is a, is, was a really fun, uh, wonderful thing to do. And if, if you, anybody's interested in buying the original, it's in my office, it's absolutely <laughs> enormous um, and for... What's it cost? <laughs> <laughs> if you gave me 20,000, you'd have it today. Oh, reasonable. <laughs> oh, there it is. Oh, this is fun. So you just get a sense of uh, the, the detail. In fact, there's us. Look, there's a king, I think. There's stuff going on. Um, and of course, an institution that's 900 years old does have a lot of stories. And I could. could but the, the, the hospital chief exec does a wonderful talk about the medical history of the stories and all the. The, the innovation that's happened here from, you know, the, the discovery of the circulation of the blood by William Harvey to the development of, of nuclear science um, and the first sort of, um, the first um, uh, cancer treatment using atomic theory was at Barnes. And here's Melvin Bragg um, un <laughs> unveiling a <laughs> great work of art uh, last year. I told you that there was, a, a, there was relevance to this. Um, and there, there is Adam, Adam's great thing. And um, we held a very moving procession from the hospital to the Priory Church on Foundation Day. We produced a wonderful book, which if you haven't got a copy of, you must buy it, um, 900 years um, of the hospital. And then, of course, in January this year, we finally started work. So we have a team um, uh, who are um, currently at work in the Great Hall itself. We've lifted the 1960s oak floor, which is very high quality and it will go back. But we found the original Georgian floor beneath it, which is wonderful, but it's so messed around. It was relayed in the 60s and sort of bashed around. Um, um, so unfortunately, it's, we can't really you know, salvage it. So it'll be it'll be left, and we'll relay the floor. Um, but um, it's this wonderful process of discovery when you start work on a building of this quality and date. You begin to poke around and take things off the wall. It, it yields up these secrets. The trouble is that when you spend a year developing a project, signing off all the designs and plans, and you suddenly discover something which actually completely contradicts your whole approach. And you have to tell the architect that we're going to actually do something radically different. It's not always easy, but um, my view is always this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to do, to do something here, and, and we have to get it right. And when you're making an intervention on a work of art of this quality, you have to get it right, 
or you have to get it as right as you possibly can. So sometimes you do have to agonize and you do have to delay decisions um, uh, because that is, that is um, how, how it should be done. And lastly, this is our scaffolding going up. And I just thought I would just gratuitously photograph of a dog. This is Bear the dog that comes with the scaffolders. So for every day this week, we've had Bear running around with his tennis ball. And there's something quite 18th century about this. I quite like it. Um, there was a famous dog, there was a famous dog, a fire dog that um, uh, followed the Regency Fire Service around London and featured in lots of popular prints, sort of dashing around heroically, running out of buildings. So, well, you know, it's nice to see the tradition, the, the, um, the canine tradition continuing at Bart's. And Hogarth, of course, would approve. There are two dogs in his paintings there. So watch this space. Um, as I said, we will be, we're aiming to complete in the summer of 2025, and then we'll be opening the doors in September um, of that year. And then from June this year, if you keep an eye on our website, we'll be advertising our conservation tours. And it'd be great to have you all here. Perhaps we could do a special tour, Peter, for, 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 for your, your group to, to bring them along. Anyway, um, that, that's it from me, and thank you very much. Well, thank you, Will. That, uh, that was splendid. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of questions. I've, I've, I've just got a, a couple. One, what, what's Edward VII doing there? And also, do you know... Uh, the antecedents of the people whose names are on the wall so you can tap them up for more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Edward VII, as Prince of Wales, was the patron of the hospital, so right. that was his link. Um, yeah, we've done a complete index of all the names now. It's searchable, we've got them in a spreadsheet. Um, the trouble is, and we, I had this problem to some extent in Greenwich, you think, oh, all these names, we can tap all their families. There are so many of them, and I went, <laughs> all, my second week, I had, um, I had lunch with Charles Hall of Hall's Bank. He's a great, he supports heritage projects. And I took this long list of Hall's names from the wall of the Great Hall and sort of triumphantly sort of presented it with him and said, you've got to support us, there's a long tradition. He put his head in his hands and no. Um, we did get a little bit of money, but it's not always as easy as it may seem um, <laughs> to, 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 to chase up those, those families. Um, but I, I think it will hopefully continue in, in a slow way to generate income over time. Very good. Now, who, who would like to ask a, a question? Anybody got? Yes. As you, you mentioned um, you know, conservation tours and others. Will there be a direct link between that and the museum when it reopens, last museum? Yeah, the museum isn't part of our current phase of work, so that's basically going to be left pretty much as it is. Um, it's going to be closed until we finish our project, then it will reopen. Um, and the idea is, under the next phase, we will um, uh, address the museum and the archives um, and, um, and improve those spaces as well. But it will continue to be open. It will be linked to the Hogarth Stair after opening, so you'll be able to come through the museum and then up the staircase. You know, as you know, traditionally up to this point, you come through the museum and there's a roped enclosure and you can sort of just look up and it's all very frustrating, unless you're lucky enough to go on one of the wonderful tours that the city guides do. Um, but that will all change. <coughs> Anybody else? Yes, um, what about the, um, St Bart's the Less, which is a really extraordinary hodgepodge of a, uh, of a building? What's going to happen to that? Well, that's obviously not that's looked after by the church, um, and uh, they are doing some repair work at the moment to the ceiling where there's, there's a bit of, sort of paint, paint's been peeling off because it, it wasn't done very well initially. So that, that, that's being fed pretty well looked after. There's a separate programme up there. And um, it will continue just to be part of the whole Bartholomew Hospital experience. You know, you'll come through, the chapel is, is a wonderful little treasure in itself. And we want people to linger and explore and enjoy, and we'll be putting lots more information out and around. So you, the idea is you can leave after having your visit with a, a much better understanding of how it all developed and what the meaning is of the art and what's important to look at. Uh, so we had uh, Benny Looney at the back there, and then we'll come to that. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. Well, thanks so much. Thanks, Benny. Really fascinating. Um, observation and a question. The observation is with the refreshed National Portrait Gallery. There's a fabulous bust of by Rubiliac of Hogarth, which meets you head on in one of the galleries there, beside the. 
portrait, a self-portrait of Hogarth. And so between these two pictures, a meter apart, you're meeting Hogarth in a profound way. Rubiliac's an amazing sculptor. And it's, it's fascinating to hear about the narrative of sculptors. I think Francis Bird may have done the, the uh, sculpture on Temple Bar here. Um, the question was, um, who is the architect that you're working with? And how, how does it go with that crazy Stephen Hall building, Maggie Center, next door? What's happening there? Well, there's a lot, a lot in that question. <laughs> I think I'll start with, um, uh, you mentioned Rubiliac in the bust. Rubiliac, interestingly, a great friend of Gibbs. Gibbs, Gibbs um, I can't remember who it was, it will come to me, but Gibbs, um, yeah, it was Pope, Alexander Pope. Pope wanted to have his uh, bust done of himself. So Gibbs suggested Rubiliac who did this very, very brilliant, but not particularly flattering bust, that Pope hated. He said, I shouldn't have asked that idiot Gibbs to recommend somebody. Um, uh, but um, there, traditionally in the hall, there, there were, sculpture was included in the iconography. There was a bust of Rehir, there were the busts of the founders, and they still are in the hall. Um, uh, there's um, Queen Victoria, uh, uh, Sydney Waterloo features there. Um, but I, I'm, I'm a, I, and there are also these wonderful life-size figures of wounded um, soldiers, um, which were part of the sort of arms collecting function of the hospital. I'd love to integrate some of the, some of those things back into the hall. It needs a bit of that back to to give it a bit of extra life and movement. So I think that's a really good reminder that we should do that. Um, in terms of the architect, we're using Purcell. Um, and um, essentially, this is a pretty straightforward conservation project. There isn't any new build, there isn't anything controversial, but it does, the detail is important, which is why I've been going on about the detail and getting the detail right. So we're working with them. We have a good sort of collaborative approach whereby I tell them what to do and they go off and complain. <laughs> and <do it. laughs> but uh, it's, uh, that works well. The whole building next door. That, that has actually delivered something very useful for us, which during the great planning hoo-ha that happened um, 10 or 15 years ago, um, when, it, when there was a um, ju 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 judicial review of the planning decision, um, the compromise was a link building between the Maggies and the North Wing should be constructed, a shared staircase with accessible toilets, a lift, and everything else. And so that's now, and that links to our building. So that's fantastic. We, we are very grateful. And we now live happily with the Maggie Centre and we'll be working with them on the health and heritage elements of the project. So different though it is, we've kind of resolved. It's all water under the bridge to me. It's not water under the bridge to some people from Bars, you know. It's a bit like going to Vietnam and people still finding an American soldier who's still fighting at the war, you know. They're kind of still, <laughs> still at it. Um, but, yeah, that's where we are. And a couple of hands down here. James. You, you, you mentioned the missing um, urns along the parapet. I hope they're going to go back. Well, they were taken off, we think, we don't know exactly when they went, but quite early in the 19th, in the 19th century. Mm. So it is difficult. You know, I think they would look rather wonderful, but quite. it would be quite conjectural about what we do, and the danger is you're sort of inventing something. I mean, I, I would... I would I would probably do it, but I think I'd probably get into quite a lot of trouble, and there'd be lots of long conversations with historic England about. Um, I support you. Yeah, thank you, James. <laughs> Maybe we'll do that. Anybody else? Yeah, well, well, thank you very much indeed. That's mm -hmm. splendid, and good luck with uh, the rest of the project, and we look forward to a, a tour when it's all yeah, done. You'd be most welcome. Thank you. Yeah.